Hello and welcome to Alvin Home and to this edition which concentrates on the platform uh, and responds to several questions that I was asked about the Metcalf kit, how you do curved ends uh, and also to show you the work that I did to um, sort of overhaul the platform uh, once I'd taken it off the layout. A bit more about the power distribution board because I've had more questions about that and there are links in the description uh, to some of the things that I mentioned. Uh, and also uh, you get a chance to see some uh, trains running uh, from TrainCam which has returned to the layout and I'll explain a bit more about that at the end. So let's get straight on having a look at what have I done to the platform uh, to give it a bit of an overhaul. I thought I'd try something different from you staring at the desk. There's a bit of staring at the desk uh, in this video, but where I think um, it will be helpful. Um, in the last video, I was talking about the work that I was going to be doing to uh, adjust the platforms. Uh, and I've got a piece later in the video, which I've already recorded, which shows the what's contained in a, in a Backman, in a, a Backman Metcalf kit and also answers some of the questions that a number of people asked me uh, in response to the last video. But I did promise that I would say what the changes were that had been undertaken uh, on the platform, which is not, not too much. The first thing that I, I did was to go through, as I said I would do, uh, let's see if get a picture, yes. You can see where there are these joiners that join the, the two parts of the track uh, two parts of the platform together. Now these are need, needed both to strengthen where the tops join but also where the wall pieces join and a number of those had become loose and this was flopping about quite a bit so I went through and marked them all and, and, and restuck those that was fairly easy. The other thing I did was to allow me to run cable as I intend to do all the way under the platform um, until so that I can wire those into the power distribution board and you may just see I can use this as a pointer sitting there the power distribution board now that is going to be sunk below that is foam uh, which raises the level and that's going to be sunk in so it sits on the on the baseboard itself uh, and all the wires are going to run to it now the, the construction of these is to put a, a piece of card in a zigzag that binds the two walls together. Instead, I've gone with some I-beam and put m actually more pieces in here than were in the, the previous, but all with a gap underneath so that I can run cables up and they won't flop, uh, flop down. The only other thing I had to do, well, I, obviously I've changed the, the ends, which I'd already told you I was going to do. And I, in, the, in the piece I've already recorded, I show how you try to work out what that curve should be. These uh, edging pieces, um, when I put them onto this end, were a different colour. Um, I don't think it was just that the previous ones were old and had faded, but they were really a quite different colour. So I've had to redo all the edges, so it's had a bit of a makeover and I've um, tidied up the platform where glues and things have been stuck on it. So that now is done and dusted. Um, the power distribution board, uh, I had a lot of questions about the power distribution board. I did do a fairly full description of the board um, in episode 116. And rather than re-record something new, I've taken what I waffled on about <laughs> in 116 and cut it down and what we'll do is we'll go to that now uh, and um, let you see that which talks about the power distribution board uh, and then uh, you can come back to me for the uh, result of the cunning plan so I'll just give the castle its voice back again and uh, I'll see you after I talk a bit about the power distribution board. The company that I buy from on eBay, and there are links in the description, um, both to the uh, eBay page from which I bought my 
power distribution board, and it's the same one as I've always been going to, uh, but also to more detailed instructions on the power distribution board, uh, which are really quite um, quite good. Uh, I've got. Uh, this can avoid you needing to put uh, resistors where you've got three volt lamps. Uh, normally, you would have you would have to step the voltage down unless you manage to have a three volt supply um, in order to be able not to blow the lamps. Uh, this clever little thing can deliver the voltage to these terminals and you can have up to 28 lamps, all of the same voltage uh, with one slight caveat um, on each power board. These are the two inputs, um, and obviously you would use one or other. There is a third input because you can daisy chain these power boards together, and you, that's where it would receive the power from uh, the board that's got the direct power source, uh, and that's where, where the power goes out again. Uh, the key thing for us is this bit here. If I bring it up, uh, you will see that you can set this to be either direct or three volts. Um, it's set with this jumper and the jumper is set for three volts because obviously it's to the left. If I set it to the right it would put power to these terminals at whatever rate it's coming in here. So obviously if you want to use 12 volt lamps and you have a 12 volt supply coming in here I tend to use this terminal rather than the rather than the pins uh, rather than the socket. The blue thing here is the uh, dimmer uh, which allows you to obviously make the thing lighter and, or darker and that's really quite useful uh, if you don't want all your lights at full power. The blocks that I tend to use are these ones here um, which are just simple screw terminals which you'll have seen. Uh, when you can daisy chain uh, and they give you the uh, cable to daisy chain with uh, from this would be the input so this would come in from another board that would go out to another board I don't know how many boards you can actually do well I think no I do you can do as many boards as you need provided the output voltage is lower than the input voltage so the total voltage required of all the lamps that you're running plainly must be less than the power you're putting or the voltage that you're putting in. Um, I'm not a great one on electric so I'm not going to say any more. Uh, as I said there are really good um, instructions, full uh, in uh, illustrated instructions on the, on the web page. Uh, but these are just brilliant I have to say uh, and in fact um, you don't when you daisy chain them you can set these independently so you can uh, have voltage coming in here the voltage going out there is is just direct uh, and then on one board you can have a load of 12 volt lights and on another you can have three volts lights and you may recall me saying in the last video that I, well, I thought both my boards were running at um, 3 volts. In fact one is running at 12 uh, and so that's how you can you can mix them up. You can mix on an individual board so you could put 12 volt lights on that side and 3 volt lights on this side but big but you would have to put a resistor in which to my mind rather um, removes the point of having this thing uh, at all. I've just turned the uh, sound off while I'm speaking. Um, in the last video I uh, tantalised you that I was trying to find a solution to be able to get lights into the area where uh, Bagshot Terrace and Longbottom Terrace sit. And as you can see the houses have been removed. They just sit on top here, don't worry, no uh, homes were destroyed in the making of this video. Uh, 
Those of you who've been with me for a while will know that I've long wanted to put lights into this end of the layout. And if I show you here now a picture of the underside of this board, which uh, is bounded sort of roughly that area, uh, to which all the points are attached and all the associated wiring and including wiring for the droppers. Um, and my problem has been that although from the picture that you're now looking at, that was the uh, underside 90% completed, uh, two important changes were made to it. One, at, at that image does not have the um, frog juicer, which controls the polarity of this uh, double slip, which I think sits about here somewhere. And also I put an added uh, this point here when we added the uh, coal stage and there's wiring associated with that that goes off in that direction somewhere. Now getting power to the houses was not ever a problem uh, because I could do that in a number of ways. The problem comes in that the um, lamps nearly always have an area to the bottom. If I take this lamp and bring it into focus, please focus, be good, come on. Um, you'll see that below the lamp there is a section. Now that's quite stiff and, there, and it, it's, that's useful because when you put it in that's one of the things that actually holds it in place. So I need to be able to drill through the board to be able to sink this in unless I was to put some kind of raised area which means these lamps would sit really very high and look rather strange. Uh, and my problem has been that I simply don't know where things are underneath here to know where I can safely stick a drill bit through. Because if I were to cause major damage in putting a drill bit through, uh, lifting this board now would be seriously disruptive to the layout. It's not impossible because obviously if points went then I would have to do something about it but it is not something I would likely want to do. Um, it dawned on me only a few weeks ago that actually what I built here is a stud wall. This may have given give you an inkling as to what my potential solution may be which is still being tested so you, you haven't seen anything done. The answer was one of these little beauties which is a stud wall finder. Now I'm not going to try and uh, show you this because when I tried to record this before all you see is a, a green screen here and, and no real detail. Um, it's now going to prove me wrong. Oh well, yeah, can I? No, yeah, I was right. This um, tool can be used to go across a stud wall to find where the wooden cross members and uprights are uh, and also to find where metal may be and separately where power lines may run. And plainly if you're going to drill into a wall it's quite helpful to know where the water pipes and electricity cables uh, and the battens that, that hold the wall up. So what I'm doing at the moment is testing. Um, I've already been able to, because I know where the up, there's an upright that runs about here and the, the stud wall finder has found the upright. It has found both edges of the, of the upright and where its centre is, as it's supposed to, which is good. Uh, and it also has found and located power cables, though that test I've done by taking uh, power cables I can get, get, power, uh, get access to putting them under a piece of six millimetre ply, which is the depth of this board, and running across and sure as eggs it's finding them. And it has also found metal, um, obviously there's no point trying it on the tracks, but where I know there are screws on things and I've run the thing across and it's shown where they are. I want to do a few more tests to be absolutely sure, but I think it is quite likely that I can get some street lights, which is all I'm looking to do, into this area, certainly six of them, because all I need to be sure about is six points that I can stick a drill bit through to be able to put the, the lights in. I'm not going to be trying to light the Metcalf buildings because when I built those buildings, this comes back to my point about planning 
the layout appropriately. Um, when I built those buildings, I had no intention of putting lights into them. So all they are inside is plain card. And in fact, the upstairs of them, look you look straight through from the front to the back. So if you put a light inside, all you would see is probably white or grey card and light would be shining from all sorts of directions. And equally, I haven't done anything on those buildings to ensure that I don't get light bleed, which is a problem with lighting. So, you know, the planning for lighting is important because it affects quite a lot of the way in which you will do things. Um, so I'm going to do a bit more testing on this and I hope to be able to get one or two uh, test holes drilled in places which I know and I'm pretty certain um, will be safe uh, and then see if I can get I think if I can get three street lamps along each terrace hmm, maybe two along each terrace uh, that will be enough to put at least sunlight in because the lighting along these terraces would not have been very bright you remember they were talking 1940s 50s uh, and I remember the street lamps um, before you got all these neon things uh, were not really very bright. So that's the cunning plan and we'll see where that goes um, hopefully in time for the next video. In response to my last video I had a number of questions about the platform uh, and how I was going to how I made the platform and how I was going to achieve the curved ends uh, and how I achieved the width of the uh, platform itself. And I realized that in being able to uh, adjust the uh, existing platform, one of the things that I was going to do was show you what goes into a Metcalf platform kit. Now I have the stone platform kit. There's another one that uses red brick for the for the side walls. Uh, so very quickly, I'm just going to show you what's in one of the Metcalf platform kits. There are other ways of doing platforms. Uh, certainly people I've seen have used uh, MDF to provide the platform base and the Pico edging. I've also seen the Pico edging used and uh, some form of sculptor mould or plaster of Paris used to fill the infill and uh, create a flat platform surface. So there's more than one way of doing things. I went with this because that was seemed to me the easiest thing to do and the least messy. Uh, and as you'll have seen from the earlier section, I'm quite happy with my platform, which now it's had its TLC uh, is, is just as strong as the day I made it really. Uh, so in the kit, you get, first of all, comprehensive instructions, which also help you with the business of curving the ends. But I'm going to show you uh, essentially what they suggest. Um, I'll leave that there in case anybody wants to pause the screen and take a screenshot. Um, but essentially, you have to use your, your largest coat. It's just the same as, as when you're laying curves on a track to make sure there is clearance for two rakes of coaches to pass. You get the platform top, which is, as you see, um, the normal size Metcalf square sheets, plenty of it, loads of it, which you can cut to your own specification. So whatever you build by way of a platform here is entirely what you need. So if you, whatever width you want to go with, you can go with, whatever shape or size you want to go with, uh, you can go with. And you get, I mean, there's loads of platform there. Um, you'll get two fairly decent sized platforms out of what's in one kit. You also get several pages of this, which is the side pieces. They're actually a double thickness and you fold one over to the other to, to make it nice and thick. I've got a piece here that is left over from when I did the platform and you can see how it's bent across and that gives you a nice rigid uh, platform edging. These here, uh, if I get it into camera, these bits here, you can use this wall also to provide a back wall to your platform if you haven't got a fence or something. And this is the pretty standard uh, capping stones that Metcalf provide. Um, if you've built 
the houses, for example, for the gardens, it's a similar, it's, not, it's a slightly different colour, but it's a similar idea for capping stones. And as you can see, you get several sheets of those, you'll make plenty of wall. And on each sheet, there are two platform end uh, shapes so that you're able to provide the ramp that takes you off the edge of a platform. And you could do with more of this, I have to say. Um, this provides the main thing this has got are these strips here, which are sticky backed. And as you'll have seen from the earlier clip, the reason that's all blank is I've used those to redo the edging on the platform. Um, I can I, I wonder if there's really enough if you were to use all the other stuff that's there. There's also some this is sticky backed as well. Uh, these are just really um, spare pieces in case you want to use them. And that is for touching up joins, really, being able to cut a piece and put it over a join between two tracks uh, to mask where the join is. Uh, although I've never used those, I've never found that the join looked so um, obvious that it needed doing them. Uh, and then you have the various um, just plain grey card, thick cardboard, which is used to provide strengthening and supports in various parts along the um, platform and also to provide, there's some longer bits here, uh, the edging to, um, this is the stuff that provides the edging for the, the side of the platform to provide a, a lip for the wall to go up to. Right, back after a coughing fit. Um, the one thing that I said I would uh, show was the uh, how you get how you work out the curvature for the ends of your platforms and I showed you the sheet uh, and I just thought I'd give you a very quick demonstration. Now in the perfect world you would be able to put a sheet of paper uh, uh, underneath your platforms but as you will have seen from the earlier clip if not then you need to be able to I mean hopefully you do this before you ballast because it gets very tricky if you've ballasted um, is, is you need paper around the, the, the track somehow because the, the, the best way to work out where your um, platform edges are going to be is to use a template and uh, I am going to find my re-railer which has now magically appeared. As a coach comes around a curve, uh, there are two things, and you also may need to do this with your widest locomotive. If, like me, you've got steam locomotives where the outside motion um, extends wider than perhaps the body of the, of the locomotive. As a coach comes around the curve, uh, two parts go wider than the, than the track. The front edge may stick out, sway out, because the bogies are turning, may sway out ahead of the, the rail, and the middle may sway out uh, over the, over the centre. So you need to, using a pen, but not a very thick pen, because you don't want it to be too far away from the body, is to hold the coach, hold this in the middle, and then draw your line as you take the coach through the curve. And you, you may be able to see there, it's, this, this is a very gentle curve, and I, because it's a short piece of flexi-track, I can't make it bend more without it springing back. Um, but the, the line here is further away from the track than it is at this point where it's gone back to the straight. And you may see that here, that's fairly straight there. It comes away from the track and then goes back. And similarly, for the outside of the curve, you take the front edge, because that's the bit that's likely to sway out if anything's going to, and then do the same idea. Oh, would help if you put it, put the pen on the paper. There you are. And that will show you where the outside edge of a curve is if your track is coming in and your platform's outside. Once you've done that, you've got your template that you can use um, for cutting 
the platform end at, at that end. And obviously you can test that by putting it up and running your train across. But I particularly promised that I would uh, show how you curve the ends of a platform. And that is how you do it. And that is how I should have done it when I first built that platform and didn't. And I've had to go back and put it right. So what was meant to be a quite short section on Metcalf has, I think, ended up at around eight or nine minutes. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, running session at the end of the video. Uh, and in particular, the shots that I've managed to get of trains coming off the uh, viaduct. Uh, with the help of Train Cam, I think it's episode 29. It's a long way back where I show how I cannibalized a, um, a spy pen uh, to create uh, Train Cam. This, I'm afraid, nearly went, well, it did actually go in the bin. Um, about three or four weeks ago, it stopped receiving any charge. Uh, and I thought, oh, well, that's that, really, and threw it in the bin. And then I remembered that I'm a railway modeler and I now have skills such as soldering. So a new battery was bought, a rechargeable battery, uh, and soldered in, and train cam rides again, as you'll have seen. So there you are, all sorts of beneficial effects from being a railway modeler. Uh, in the next video, I will be concentrating on the station buildings, um, showing you the various things that I've bought. I was going to put it into this video, but I've had so much that I've I wanted to cover uh, that it would have made the video much too long. So it's all about platforms and lighting them. And the aim of the next video is to get from the empty platform that sits over there at the moment to a fully lit and permanently fixed in uh, new platform with all its uh, interiors. So until I speak to you again in about a fortnight's time, uh, if you've liked the video, do give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, well, please do subscribe. It'd be great to have you along. And if you've got any comments, of course, those really are gold dust. So please do let me have your comments. Uh, and as I said, until I speak to you again in about a fortnight's time, that's bye-bye from me. Bye-bye.